Where is Jonah? Chapter 3. And First question, select elements in chapter 3, 1, and 2, and make God's call to people meaningful. Any application? What do you think the words, according to the Lord, mean in verse 3? Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah seven times, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, Proclaim to it the message that I tell. If you sort out those verses a little bit before we answer the question. 3 1 use the same words as 1 1. God gives Jonah the same call for the second time. And this reminds us of God's call to Peter. In John 21, here <coughs> Yeah. Uh, I think Bonnie and Karen in the question sheets and 
So what do you do with it? You know, you look at the sense of the passage and you say, what's a good English equivalent for what God's asking you to do? We have proclaim, the idea of proclamation. Some translations have preach. Here it is, call out against it. Well, you have a verb that says, go and in some way deliver this message. In fact, there's a message to be said against it is very clear. So you have a number of words um, that I will speak or announce to you. The prophet's task was to be a mouthpiece for God. We heard that <clears throat> when God called Moses. Moses said, here am I, send somebody else. And God says, okay. I need to give my word to you. You be like God to Aaron. Let Aaron be your mouthpiece. Speak to the people. That's the idea. To be a mouthpiece. <laughs> so. It's just the same word I want to say we have. Three, two, three, two, three. Right. Yeah. Same word. That's not a problem. Question? Yeah. Yes, sir. So. Looking at looking at verse verses one and two. Question. Yes. We aren't right there. What? Well, it's what's confusing because the two phrases are pretty different. To say proclaim is to tell them something. To call out against it, um, Nineveh was a city that uh, really needed to repent. So to call out against it might be calling it to task to say that the message is to, to repent. So to proclaim God's against, uh, to it is a little different than against it. See what I mean?
You learned it in catechism. <clears throat> it's not a law that's changed with times. It's still the same law. You've been given a message of great love, of forgiveness of life and salvation. And what does that mean with those that you've earned the right of a relationship with? Often when we think of our neighbors, we don't even know our neighbors' names. Yeah? You know, 1995, we moved into our neighborhood. 1986, we moved into the first neighborhood in Rockland, and we knew all of our neighbors' names. And we even got together for games and for, for meals at certain times, kind of like a, not like a block party, but a mini four neighbor, you know, party. We moved to this neighborhood and we, we have had to struggle to get to know any of their names, you know, so we, we know about, you know, let's see, for two houses next to us, I know the names of the adults. I know the names of, for certain, of one of the adults next to us and one of the adults, the household. Do we ever have any kind of conversation? Would I have a right to speak to any of them about the message that God would have me proclaim? No. But I do have a group of people, you know, in the community and around the community that I have relationship with. And when they misuse the name of the Lord, when they flaunt lifestyles that are contrary to what God says, the message is, I have sent you as one of my people not to keep your mouth shut.
Spirit wishes to produce spiritual fruits, not religious nuts. <laughs> and often, when we try to be a voice in the world, we are so abrasive, so confrontive, that we fall into the category of being religious nuts. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Detail. Overthrow my home. Mm -hmm. 
Now, was Babylon going to invade? <laughs> was, yes? Um, this is not the answer to that question, but can you imagine how courageous Jonah was? It was a three day experience of the city. He got a day. He was almost to the middle of the city, and he calls out with something like that, and the, the city was very against God, and they all could have come down and then killed him right then. Right. It was not a popular message to be created. Not a popular message. Can be overthrown. In the Old Testament lesson for today, um, Amos goes to the northern kingdom, and they say, get out of here. We can't stand your message. Go back home. Yeah. We don't want to listen to you. And here, what was, you know, was Jonah's message? It evidently is in bare outline or title form here. Because what's missing is God. And evidently, God was spoken about. And because what happens in verse 5? It says they believe. They believe God. Jonah goes in and says, hey, people, 40 days, and your city's going to be a ruin. And they believe God. <coughs> I mean, little kids may look up to me and say, when I'm in my robes, are you Jesus? <laughs> but I mean, adults? Uh, I just wanted to add a uh, part of the reason why Jonah's message was received away was because it was God's message. God. Because when you go back to verse 2, you know, my translation says, proclaim to them the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. And so Jonah has God's exact words to say. And so Jonah goes out and says those exact words. It's a bigger message. That's, you know, what you're called to do as a pastor. And, you know, you go out and you use God's person. Same as we're called to do with our family and our neighbors, is to do <coughs> God's work. Not to change them to suit our needs, to take them out of context, but to give them what God says. Yeah. Now, if you look at verse 4, and you look at verses 5, 8, and 9, um, what do these people do? Sin. They not only believed something, they did what? They called out. Right. Called out to God. Right. They took action. Mm -hmm. yep. We see that action <coughs> right there. And uh, um, yeah. it's God's message and it has an effect on them. And the people believe God and look at the action. They do that Old Testament thing of repentance. Putting on sackcloth. And the word reached the king. And he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in action. Old Testament image of repentance. You know, some people mock at the account of Nineveh um, that it would repent. And probably not a lot of us remember this. I only remember it from history, but uh, enough of it. Uh, relate this to uh, the uh, Orson Wells uh, invasion from Mars that uh, was on a radio and the effect it had on the nation. Everybody believed it was true. We were invaded by Mars. 
as incredible as that seemed. I mean, we hadn't even gone into orbit yet. <laughs> we hadn't yet landed on the moon yet. And yet, it was so realistically portrayed as just the word of man on the radio. And people, and people believed it. Now, I heard about this the first time uh, my mother told it to me, and I said, How can I say it? And so they believed it. Now, we've got another similar phenomenon going on. Put anything out on the internet. <laughs> And it gets believed as what? Truth. It's true. It's true. That's that. There is so much misinformation out there. I uh, I went ahead and uh, uh, wanted to uh, find out well about the incident from Kimball. Um, I had emailed. Uh, Pastor Mars told him we prayed for him, had a little bit of a conversation with him, thanked us for the prayers. Um, and then I, I just wanted to find out a little bit more detail before I wrote the introduction for today's sermon. And so I hit the internet and I put in the base facts. Oh man, we've got videos. We've got misinformation upon misinformation. Um, we have it linked to St. John's Lutheran in Kimball, Minnesota. Yeah. Didn't you know those Kimball, Minnesota? Yeah. Sure enough. Pardon? The Minnesotans are telling us where it is. Okay. Anyway. Um, it's just unbelievable. So, people say, oh no. You couldn't have a repentance of a mighty city like this. Because imagine a prophet of God, mighty, sent by God into the middle of Sacramento. We're not going to pick on the end of this. We'll just pick on Sacramento. Could you see Sacramento repenting in mass? <laughs> the governor issuing a proclamation. And here, yeah, it seems totally incredible, and yet, um, Word of God says it occurred, and we see the reaction of it occurred. The other part that's real hard to believe is we know so much about Nineveh and Assyria. A murderous, merciless nation. Um, where was that? I can't. Thank 
archaeologists found Nineveh. Yeah. Never has been rebuilt, but they found the ruins of Nineveh. Where is it? Where is it? It's across the river from Mosul. On the other side of the river of Mosul, present day Mosul. That's where the ruins of Nineveh are. <laughs> There's still ruins there. The There's still there. ruins on the other side. I know Mosul is now ruins. But yeah, it's on the other side of Mosul. Near Assyria. Near Assyria or in Assyria? Yes. But, well, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria in the ancient times. But today it's part of Iraq. But now, we not only have Jonah back there, Pastor. Yes? Well, I'm going back to their repentance. They didn't believe in the God, so how did they explain this in the How did they make the repentance? Yeah. Well, they just frightened the dad? It's part of the message of Jonah. Um, is that they heard the message, and in spite of their idolatry, and at this time, they turn to the one true God. Now, in the Old Testament, editors love to play around with this. If it's an idolatrous God, what kind of letter is written? Lowercase. And if it's the one true God, it's uppercase. And so they turn to the one true God. Based on that message of Jonah, we don't have the whole message. Yeah. Probably took it for 16 weeks of, you know, living with God. Right? Or Lutheranism <coughs> 101. He doesn't say, but do you, were they aware that Jonah had just spent the last three days in that fish? I mean, no. do you think that was, no. He's got these men. He's got these men. No. Because they don't know the history of Jonah. Because God says, proclaim the message that I will give you. Or cry out the message I give you. So it's, it's being given a message. You know, it's just like the message we receive. Where did we get it from?
Well, the specific verse is 41. I'll start at 38. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered Jesus, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights from the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Or somewhat greater than Jonah is here. Something, the Christ, someone, Jesus of Nazareth, greater than Jonah is here. And we don't repent. But look at the people in Nineveh. They did. And of course, if you look at the parallel passage in Luke, Jesus says the same thing. Yeah. And you wonder, could China or Iran turn to Christianity in our day? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. The word of the Lord could convince them. They resisted greatly in China. But I wonder if we've ever seen any mass kind of conversion. No. It would take a one by one by one by one by one by one by one. And I don't have time in what's left with us to go to you know, the million upon million of people that we're talking about. So, okay. <laughs> So he issues a decree in verse 7. And by decree, the king and his nobles, neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. We think it's long. But people of the ancient times involved animals in ceremonies of repentance. By cutting their hair and putting sackcloth on. That was. Whenever you invade a culture that has idolatry, even though when they turn to the one true God, they don't clean up all of their lives. Right? Right. How many customs and how many ceremonies? do we have that we've incorporated into the Christian church that came from pagan Europe? Christmas tree. Christmas tree. No, no that, that didn't come from pagan Europe. That came from Luther. The Christmas trees. I know. Oh, sorry. I just heard something like that. Oh, wait. That's not pagan. Um, Luther did the Christmas tree. Yeah. The idea of trees in homes, had roots, yeah, in other parts of Europe, yeah, <coughs> even the Druids put trees in their homes. But when we're, the what time trees. were the Druids? Right. You know, it, it's, it's right. all we got in the well, I mean, even from that time, through a lot of Europe, bringing a tree in, um, in doing some of the research for this sermon, In Eastern Europe, the worship of Personi, the goddess of spring, what you would do is you would bring a tree into the house and decorate it because life had returned to the earth only to die again at, uh, in the fall. So bringing in a living plant and decorating it, keeping it through the growing season. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't mean the Luther was inspired in the Christmas tree by those customs, but they were there. So sometimes we'll hear about the Christmas tree. 
but hot cross buns, pretzels, as a Latin symbol. Now, they all came, they were all part of the time of year celebrations. Now, we even tried to deal with uh, carnival or washing and, you know, try to get it as uh, a shutdown before rent. Not always successful. Um, nor have we addressed all the abuses that were there. Which is just a lot of things that we just we pick up. Well, what do you have here? They're repenting. They're believing in the one true God, but they're still involving animals in their, in their ritual. That just goes to show what goes on. Um, in the time we have left, I want to really get down to the end of the chapter. 9 and 10. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn away from his fierce <coughs> anger so he may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and did not do it. Those who have other translations for 9 and 10, what does it mean or what does it say about God relented of the disaster? What are the words used? Compassion. Okay, you have compassion. What word for relent? Okay. Most translations, God repented. God repented of his action. Whoa! This says he relented. I know. The other word is repent. Yeah, look at a lot of your translations, and you'll find it says God repented. Well, where did you hear of God relenting or repenting before? Pardon? With the Hebrews all the time. All the time with the Hebrews. Because God says, you walk this way and I will destroy you. This is my judgment upon you. The people turn from their evil ways. And therefore, God does what? Turns from his judgment. We get so connected that repenting always has to deal with sin that knowing that God can turn from an announced action is hard for us to get our mind around. What does the word repent mean? It means you're going this way. That's all it's done. As a human being, you're heading down a pathway of sin. God's word. You continue down this path, and I will judge you. I will write you off. People turn, and now God says, I will forgive. I will have compassion. All that's being said there. Yes, God. Another expression of God's anger. Turn back from his anger. And you have mercy upon us. Right. And so you get that. ESV, love to use with lens. Because we have a hard time understanding the word repent. 
and uh, um, so. God's basic nature, as 1 John reminds us, or God's basic nature, as the Old Testament reminds us, is one of love. Right? In the Old Testament, it's usually translated what? Steadfast love or loving kindness. People always say, why did God create the world? Love. God's key word is love or grace. It's his basic nature. In Ezekiel, what does he say to his own people? Why, oh why, will you not turn and live? I have no desire to kill the guilty. But you continue to reject me. Why, oh why, will you not turn and live? Turn, repent, and live. But if you won't repent, I have to do what I don't want to do. So, God and man say yes together to others, and Jonah gets there, and the people repent. We don't know too much about Jonah. We'll find out how happy Jonah is next week. And with that, let us close. Praise of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>